Welcome everybody um, on this Tuesday, the 6th of June. If you're in Joburg or Cape Town, I believe it's very chilly. So um, warm greetings to you all. So on behalf of Sormaling South Africa, the Department of Trade, Industry and Co Competition, the Universities of Stellenbosch and Pretoria and Earthworld Architects, we welcome you to the next episode of Talking Timber, focusing this time on certification chain of custody and sustainable sourcing. We thank the Green Building Council of South Africa for their participation and a special mention must go to the Forest Stewardship Council or FSC who have made this webinar possible. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Samantha Charles and I work with Sawmilling South Africa. I'm your host today. It's quite fitting that we are hosting this topic the day after World Environment Day. It's also World Environment Month. Um, and in my books, actually, we shouldn't be just doing it's trying to save the world on one day. We should be doing it all the time. So architects, designers and construction engineers need to understand that their approach to material sourcing could affect the natural environment and communities and that many clients are caring more about these issues. By using certified wood in construction or becoming a certified product supplier, or manufacturer, companies can demonstrate the strongest possible commitment to protecting our forests and plantations. Sourcing sustainable timber from accredited growers and in doing so gain significant benefits for their customers, their brands and their businesses. I will now hand over to Dr. Skull Krubler to make some announcements and introduce our speakers. He is a senior lecturer and the chairperson of the York Timber Chair in the Wood Structural Engineering Department. Uh, wood Structural Engineering at the University of Pretoria. Over to you, Skulk. Thank you very much, Sam. Yes, there's a, a couple of announcements that I just quickly want to make. Um, first thing, um, thank you very much for joining the session. Um, in terms of the webinars, we also uh, we collaborate in t uh, with various um, entities and uh, among other the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition and the uh, department is currently um, running a survey uh, to evaluate the um, feasibility of promoting timber construction in South Africa. We appreciate if you take part in that survey. Um, I'll shortly share the link to that survey. Um, we are also um, glad to announce that we will this year host a timber design competition for architectural students from any university or um, architectural school in um, South Africa. I will also share the information regarding that in the chat box. So going on with the webinar, uh, our first speaker is um, Gerard Bisa. He's currently the Head of Marketing and Communications and Value Chain Development at the Forestry Stewardship Council. Uh, he has more than 20 years marketing experience in business to business marketing and the wood products related sector, uh, including preservation, engineered wood products and forest product certification. Uh, he was also instrumental in getting the first preservative treated timber accredited according to South African Green Building Council criteria. Gerard has also had extensive experience in coordinating marketing collaboration across the entire forestry and timber product value chain working with a number of industry associations. For the last three to four years, he has headed up the marketing, communications and value chain development and FSC Council uh, of Southern Africa. So without further ado, Gerard, um, thank you very much for doing this presentation. Okay, great. No, no, thank you for this this, this wonderful opportunity to, to, to talk about um, the certification of timber and the sustainable sourcing um, of timber. Um, so just really wanted to do a bit of an introduction to uh, the Forest Stewardship Council. Um, so we were founded in 1994 as a voluntary certification system uh, for sustainable forestry. Uh, and our mission is to promote um, environmentally sound, socially beneficial and economic viable management of the world's forests. Now, clearly, you know, forests play an important role in society in terms of being a natural solution for climate change, uh, supporting Earth's biodiversity and providing homes and employments to millions of people around the world in terms of communities and our indigenous people. So the FSC, uh, obviously short for the Forest Stewardship Council, is a member-run organization 
um, we, we have uh, three equally weighted chambers, and every three years uh, they meet in a general assembly where various motions are discussed and, and voted upon. Uh, and uh, for a motion to pass, it has to have, um, has to pass through all three chambers, our environmental chamber, which represents NGOs, environmental interest groups, research organizations, our economic chamber, which really represents many of the, uh, the forest, uh, forestry companies um, and wood product sector companies, and in the social chamber, which would be indigenous people, community organizations, and, and labor unions, and, and so on. So everything is really done in a, in, in, in a balanced approach as such. This just kind of gives you an indication of uh, one of our, our general assemblies. So you'll see a wide representation. It's normally run over a week. Uh, the one this year was really delayed by two years uh, because of COVID, was held in Bali. And, of, and, and a number of key key motions were, were, were passed at, at our General Assembly. So, so why is the FEC the most credible sustainable forestry solution? Um, our standards are amongst the most rigorous forest certification standards in the world. They are globally consistent, but they are nationally adapted. I've mentioned that we we governed by economic, social, and environmental uh, perspectives. Um, we are supported by a, a number of the world's most reputable NGOs. Uh, the FEC logo is a very well recognised sustainable uh, mark scheme, and uh, not just for forestry, but uh, across the various sustainable standards. Um, we. Our business reach is extensive. We have more than 55,000 certificate holders worldwide. Um, we deal with bad actors in our system. Um, we obviously have a solution to tackle uh, the climate crisis. Uh, our biodiversity uh, aspects are, are most are extensive. And then, yes, we obviously champion the rights of indigenous people and protect the, the rights of, of workers. So in terms of our reach around the world, we are um, we have members in more than 80 countries. Uh, our forest certification systems are in more than 65 countries worldwide. We have just under 158 million hectares that are certified and more than 55,000 uh, chain of custody um, certificates. So as I mentioned before, we are trusted by leading NGOs. Um, such as WWF, the Rainforest Alliance. Um, our recent research surveys shows that more than 77% of consumers show moderate to high levels of confidence that FEC does protect the forests. And this, this, this perception or this percentage actually exceeds that for, for companies and governments. And then, you know, we trusted by, by key businesses around the world. Uh, and then more locally, you know, we obviously also partner with the, most of the big retail groups in South Africa uh, across all, all merchandise categories, including uh, building timber and building supplies. So how does the FEC system operate? Um, so it really is driven by initially the forest management standard, um, which is awarded to organizations who manage their forests in socially, environmentally, and economically responsible ways. And this applies both to natural and plantation forests. Um, so the first forests in South Africa were certified in 1997, um, which I think, which if I recall, was um, a South African forestry company, SAFCOL, or KLF. And then after that, a number of your, your leading sawmill groups, within two or three years, a lot of them, most of all the big sawmilling groups became certified. Then we have the chain of custody, and now the chain of custody kicks in in terms of the secondary pro secondary processing. So as the timber is transformed or processed through the supply chain, this is where the chain of custody um, occurs. So there's a chain of ownership. Here, there's a change of ownership here, and there's a change in form of the actual product. Okay, and this is where the chain of custody certification applies. It is its own standard. And these companies are audited on an annual basis to ensure that they abide by the chain of custody. Then clearly for the consumers, the FEC label provides the assurance 
that there is supply chain integrity at each link of the value chain, all the way from the forests through to the actual uh, retail or the actual building site. And we do enter into strategic rela rela uh, relationships with many of the retailers to help them achieve their, their sourcing requirements. So in terms of the in terms of the back end of the system, okay, so FEC develops various its standards. Those standards would be for forest management, for controlled wood, for chain of custody. Then these standards are audited by third party certification bodies. And these certification bodies are in, in essence monitored uh, by Assurance Systems International, which ensures that the certification bodies conform with the actual sustainability standards. Okay. Um, so in South Africa, we have four certification bodies that are operate in terms of the Soil Association, SGS, Bio Veritas, and DNV. Uh, the latter are, are, are two new certification bodies. And then uh, FEC, uh, as well as ASR, are also part of our seal, which is an international uh, governing governance body for various certification bodies. So we belong to that, the likes of Fair Trade, Marine Stewardship Council, Rainforest Alliance, uh, Better Cotton, etc. And then obviously what happens is once the product passes through the supply chain, then obviously the end product um, can be labeled or can be sold as an FEC certified product as such. So there are three main labels. Um, there's a 100% label, uh, which refers to 100% FEC certified fiber. Um, then there is the FEC recycled label, and then there's the FEC mix. In the case of timber, it would generally be a uh, FEC 100% um, label. Um, so supply chain integrity is an integral part of our system. Um, so we do engage in research in terms of um, wood, wood, various wood identification technologies. Also in terms of transaction verification, we've been piloting a blockchain system to be able to match players in our supply chain to ensure that um, false claims are not made. And then we also have integrity investigations into supply chains where we feel that um, they obviously there's something amiss. Um, and then we obviously will investigate that and then if need be, we'll terminate um, uh, uh, licenses and, and, and trademark licenses as well. So when it comes to sustainable sourcing, you know, our research shows us that consumers are becoming more and more concerned about environmental issues in terms of biodiversity, deforestation, and looking at more suitable alternatives. Okay, not necessarily just plastic, I and mean, that would obviously clearly be in your in your packaging value chain. But you know, consumers are looking for choosing products that do not damage plants and animals. Uh, that do not contribute to deforestation, and also looking at materials that are, are renewable. So in terms of the recognition of, of the FEC logo around the world, it's just under 50%, but it is quite high in places in Africa, such as South Africa and Kenya, and obviously very high in, in, in parts of Europe, uh, Latin America. Um, so it, it's obviously encouraging to see. And we, we do this benchmarking research every three years, to just obviously just see you know where we're positioned in terms of other sustainability standards. So when it comes to mass timber building, you know what are the benefits to mass timber? Okay, well it all really comes down to the origin of, of the timber. Okay, and so sustainable sourcing is is, is absolutely essential. Okay, we know that uh, that timber obviously stores CO two. We also know that um, you know there's obviously concerns regarding uh, natural plantations in terms of species diversification, particularly with tropical forests. And so obviously certification is seen as added key value to this and also as a risk mitigation tool. Uh, in terms of plantation forests, as, as in South Africa, um, you know obviously the sustainable forest management is, is equally important. Um, and for example, and that was one of the reasons why it was actually introduced into South Africa many years ago, is that there, there was, there, well, there wasn't, and there still is, I suppose, to a degree, environmental pressure on plantation forestry in terms of them being these big glorified tree farms. And so where certification came in is that it actually showed 
that the forests, the plantations were managed in a sustainable manner. And this obviously has it certainly helped the plantation industry uh, in terms of the way they, they, manage, they manage their forests. Um, we also have, um, obviously, FEC source timber complies with green building schemes. And I'm going to spend a little bit time, a little bit of time on uh, discussing uh, FEC project certification with you. So in terms of the construction supply chain, I think we're all quite aware of this, is that we've got our raw materials, in this case, coming out of the forest. They then obviously go through a manufacturing process. So we basically have a, a saleable piece of timber or an engineered wood product. Um, which then is obviously uh, processed further by uh, obviously through your production system, okay? And then we obviously have the whole the the, the, the whole client and the cons and your various consultants involved in terms of the specifying of timber. Often this is coordinated by a project manager. So we have these different players in the construction supply chain. Now, from a certification perspective, clearly the forests are certified. The manufacturers would need to be certified and ideally the contractor would need to be certified for the claim to be passed to the end user. Now, what happens in reality is that contractors may be aware that they may be sourcing FEC certified timber, but it's not necessarily a claim that has been verified in terms of a full chain of custody process. Um, so. And then we also know that obviously many green building certification systems around the world um, are encouraging, say it's system, but probably encouraging the use of uh, sustainably certified wood. So, for example, we know that, for example, around the world, Green Star Australia, the Green Building Council, uh, the DG, DGNB in Germany, uh, Caspi in Japan, and, and, and Bream in the UK um, are, are asking for. Or ask, asking for certified um, certified building timber. So the FSC a few years ago obviously realized that the normal chain of custody is a bit complicated for builders. So it's all very well for uh, the sawmill to be chain of custody certified and possibly um, you know uh, production further down the supply chain. But for the actual building contractor to become chain of custody certified, is quite complicated, okay? Because you know they may, because obviously the, a timber may just be a component of uh, of the project they're involved with, and you know when it comes to calculating the certification cost, they're looking at the complete structure. So this is where the FEC project certification comes into play, and it's particularly developed with the built environment in mind, where it enables uh, the project owner to be and when i say the owner i'm using this in the most generic sense so the project owner could be the actual owner of the the property where the construction is taking place it could be the builder it could even be the architect okay so the pro so project certification has a quite a wide a wide scope in terms of who the project manager is but what it does allow is that the the the, the, the wood can be verified as coming from an FEC certified um, source. Okay, it also provides direct recognition of commitment to forest conservation by that particular project. It can be used independently, or it can be part, or it can complement uh, green building or other certifications. It can also be a full project certification on the entire structure or it can relate to components such as windows, cladding, framing. But what's important here is that chain of custody is applied, is provided for the project, but under an FEC project license code, okay, which is also accredited by an FEC accredited third party certifier. So in terms of the types of project certification, it can be a, a once off project certification, or it could be a continuous project certification, which could be, for example, you know, when it's an ongoing development over a number of years, or it could even be an architect, architectural firm that commits to, um, you know, sourcing from FEC certified sources through multiple projects. Okay, so there is a bit of there's quite a bit of flexibility in terms of um, the type of project certification. 
Um, and then in terms of the claims, as I said, um, the claims are based on uh, products that are FEC certified. It can be made on components or it can be made on the same structure. It could also be a percentage claim, okay, where it looks at the percentage of forest-based materials used in the final project, okay. Um, and it is a far more, as I said, a far more suited way of um, of using certified materials in a building project than possibly um, and more cost effective than a than a standard chain of custody conventional chain of custody arrangement. So, in terms of some examples of various projects, this, for example, is a a restaurant that was built in the Republic of Congo. By, by the Double Wildlife Conservation Society. So there you see it has an actual project certification code, whereas a normal chain of custody would be a C code. In this instance, it's a, it's a P code for FEC certified project. And obviously this can be used to, to create awareness that the project has been FEC certified. It can obviously be used for promotional purposes, for signage purposes at the project, and for, if you want to call it, bragging rights on one's website, etc. Uh, this is another example in the UK of Canary Wharf, where this was a, a multiple uh, FEC, a, 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 a multiple project over a number of years where there were certain phases, uh, but still under the same project code. So over a period of 10 years, more than 18,000 cubes of FEC certified timber have be, has been used uh, in various uh, Canary Wharf project co components. This is an example in Spain, uh, where obviously, you know, when you start tying these claims to uh, carbon sequestration, obviously, it obviously be enables one to, um, yeah, you know, make quite significant statements in terms of, uh, uh, you know, um, in terms of uh, carbon usage or carbon storage of the actual building. And then this was a building, a high-rise building that was built in the south of Germany in Freiburg. So it's an eight-story building, complete wooden building um, that was also also certified. Um, yeah, so this just shows you some some examples. The project certs, project certification in South Africa, we have not pursued it just really due to, um, I guess, um, you know, uh, yeah, just in terms of. Um, staffing and obviously just in terms of providing being able to provide support but it's something that we really would like to engage with the industry more on um and just some closing thoughts is that you know it's all very well to look at the carbon footprint and and environmental benefits of wood but if that wood is not produced or harvested in a sustainable manner then it really doesn't mean that much okay um, so, yes, with FEC, you have this assurance that the timber that you use comes from forests managed according to high international recognized standards. Obviously, the other benefits would be that it, it meets green building requirements in terms of sustainable sourcing and local content. And as I said, this whole, this whole aspect of project certification is something that we would like to just explore with the industry in a lot more detail. Um, obviously, yes, FEC certified wood ensures supply chain integrity. Uh, it can also be a great tool in terms of corporate social responsibility and corporate reputation. And also it enables one to obviously proactively market wood compared to other construction materials. So, uh, yes, I think that, that, that that's all from me. And then, I mean, obviously, Sam, you can just guide us in terms of when you want to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you very, very much. Um, I think we'll um, hold on to the questions. I don't see any in the chat, so we'll leave those till after Georgina has spoken, but I'll hand back to Skulk to do that introduction. Uh, our next presenter is Georgina Smith. She's the head of technical at the Green Building Council of South Africa. Uh, she oversees a certification and the research related products that drive the property sector to design, build and operate buildings in a more sustainable way. She manages the technical team at the Green Building Council, who are responsible for independently certifying green and net zero buildings and identifying market leaders. Her daily responsibilities include driving market transformation through certification, 
which can verify tangible, quantifiable impacts and providing customer-focused technical support to all stakeholders engaging with the Green Building Council, both in the private and public sector. Uh, Georgina, thank you for taking the time to do the presentation. Yeah, great. So in terms of my presentation, I'm going to go over a few key items. The first would just be a brief and general introduction to the Green Building Council to share what we do in this space. If there is any way um, you think it would be worthwhile to connect, we really are here to celebrate a lot of the good work uh, that you know architects like yourselves are doing and to demonstrate and to kind of showcase and share learnings where you know things are either new or uh, it's around innovation or around new materials. So I would encourage you please to, to reach out to me if, if you think that we can um, support in any way, uh, because this is a really great initiative that the sawmilling industry and, and government are participating in. Um, you know, we believe strongly that timber and alternative materials have a really significant role to play inside Africa's green economy and um, the kind of job potential and economic development potential of these kind of conversations really hold a lot of potential for South Africa and its future. future. Um, I'm also going to go over some of the benefits of building with wood, obviously. Then, as Harold mentioned, I'm going to explain how using timber will support any green building certification that you either might be supporting your client um, in achieving. And then lastly, I've got you know, uh, a few examples to share. So I have to have a look at the uh, list of attendees. And um, you know, I just for those of you who don't know who we are, we are a not-for-profit. We've been around since 2009. And our role, our reason for existing really is to support the built environment and its transformation to a more sustainable outcome. We are member based. The GBCSA started with the commercial sector um, and really the you know the private sector just kind of ran with it. And in the last I'd say five to six years the GBCSA has been trying to support the residential market and the residential sector as well in terms of greening and finding tools and ways to assess and showcase sustainability in, in a more residential um, specific way. And we have seen an uptake and a demand uh, within the resi section um, in the last few years, particularly in the last two years. We also support a lot of uh, developing green building councils within the African continent. And we are a big believer in collaboration. Uh, you know, we think initiatives like this are really great because it is about sharing, um, you know, often on learning curves, uh, there are mistakes to be made, but there are also lessons to be shared. And, and this is how we do it. So collaboration is a key passion of ours. And um, we have been collaborating either with different research partners. The University of Pretoria is actually such one. So the QS department um, looks at the cost of greening for us and publishes reports, which are available on our website, to look at the cost of growing green. So some of you might be familiar with the Green Building Council through our certification schemes. So you might be familiar with things like a green star rating, an edge rating, an EBP rating. I'm not going to go into certification in any detail in this session. If you would like to know more about it, please, you know, do let me know. But I think it's worthwhile just understanding the scale and, and how, fun, how far we've come um, as an industry in South Africa. So we've already issued about 950 certifications in the you know in the last 10 years and what is worthwhile and it was also echoed in Harrod's talk is through certification we are able to quantify what the impacts are 
And the key focus of certification is to ensure that we don't have any form of green washing. Because every client, every architect, every, every developer is going to tell you that they, you know, are the greenest, that they're implementing green initiatives, and that's great. The point of it is to have a system or a standard that exists for industry to say, well, you know, this is the standard, this is the industry benchmark. Are you able to demonstrate that you have exceeded it? So let's chat a little bit about building with timber. So I think I just wanted to touch on the fact and fact and remind everybody, obviously, you know, humans have been building with timber forever. Um, and, you know, there are many, many examples worldwide, particularly within a residential space. And when we think about, you know, historical buildings, whether they're kind of churches or, you know, or community buildings. Um, but we have been doing this for some time, and this is, you know, just for fun, an example of a roller coaster in order to demonstrate that, you know, timber has been used and has been able to sustain structural stability and mechanical forces. And this was built in 1996. But obviously, as we all know on the call, it's not a common building material in South Africa, particularly when we are thinking outside of residential. You know, even for residential, it's it's not common in South Africa, although I would say that that's where we have the most examples of building with timber in South Africa in terms of, you know, individual homes. Um, and that's not true in, you know, countries like the States, where timber is very much a common building material for single dwelling uh, units. But the appetite and, you know, the environmental awareness around uh, timber's potential has really increased the interest um, to make more use of timber as a structural building material. So, so let's to touch on the benefits. The first relate more um, to kind of you know program and um, design benefits. Obviously, it's a lightweight uh, you know structural material, which means that you can build pretty quickly. So that would in, for, for the most part, and as a generalization, translate into program and cost benefits. There are also um, new possibilities in terms of kind of structures and you know level of flexibility because of timber's unique uh, properties. For many, timber is aesthetically appealing. It can be used very beautifully. Um, some of the most striking buildings, uh, you know, that I see on architectural blogs or, you know, when I'm looking online, incorporate incredible elements of, of timber. There's also the, the other side where, you know, you feel like you're in a in a sauna. So, you know, obviously aesthetics is, is subjective, but, you know, it goes without saying that the warmness, um, you know, the the fact that people feel connected to nature in terms of being connected to a natural material holds incredible value as a design feature for architects and for designers. And then obviously, you know, there is a myth that uh, timber is not fire resistant, but if uh, treated correctly, it, it definitely is. Um, the example here is of a timber structure that, or a timber building that has already been completed. I think um, if I remember correctly, this was 2017, 2018 when this was completed. It was in Sydney in Australia. It's a seven story uh, all timber building. So the floors, the columns, the walls, the beams, everything is um, CLT or, or mass timber. Um, I think yeah, the bottom floor is retail and the, and the top uh, six floors above it are timber. So then to focus a little bit on the environmental benefits of building with timber, which is where the Green Council, um, you know, comes in and where we advocate for the use of wood. Timber is obviously a renewable resource, and that is always going to be a better option in comparison to a finite resource, which, you know, needs to be mined and definitely cannot be, you know, replaced at, at the same rate as extraction which is where you know we would find ourselves with current uh, kind of uh, mineral extraction for more uh, traditional construction materials such as steel and aluminium it allows for local resources and materials to be procured we obviously know that this is not always the case because sometimes uh, you know in countries that aren't producing their own timber 
um, they would be importing the wood. You can also develop a very sustainable supply chain to support that. Timber has got great thermal insulating properties. It's also got very good acoustic properties. And then very importantly, um, and so, you know, those that the, the features that I've just mentioned would contribute to the performance, the in-use performance of the building, you know, both from an energy perspective, but then also from a um, indoor um, uh, quality perspective. But the key space where the use of timber is getting a lot of focus at the moment and, you know, why it has really come to the forefront of the agenda is its ability to reduce the embodied carbon of a new building that is being designed and constructed. So this is an example of a proposed building, but if you, you know, look online, there are a lot of these uh, around uh, in terms of new, you know, high rise timber buildings or and that contain elements of structural timber, if not, um, you know, being totally uh, built with timber. And um, they're incredibly futuristic looking um, and very interesting aesthetics that I can imagine would appeal to, to um, architects. So please do go and have a look. Um, and this is one that has been proposed that you know, is 310 meters, um, obviously using CLT timber panels. So let's just go back to some of the basics. The climate science modeling has indicated that we need to limit the temperature increase to below one and a half degrees. And so there's a baseline that was established. Certain measurements indicate that we have, you know, already met a large portion of that budget. So here's a popular site that's often referenced. Um, and, you know, the claims that we've already used 1.1, um, or that we're already at 1.1 degrees in that warming. The um, Paris Agreement, you know, concluded that there, that there would be this commitment on a global scale to limiting emissions to, you know, below one and a half degrees. Working backwards from that, the implication is that, that we need to reach net zero in terms of emissions by a certain time frame. And so this instigated the coordination, the coming together of a lot of global active actors to set global targets from a carbon emissions perspective. And this is where Timber has a strong role to play. This is very important globally, but it's also worth understanding what are the risks to South Africa if we don't reach our carbon goals? And particularly, and unfortunately, is, is positioned to feel the effects of climate change, unfortunately, far more worse than other parts of the globe. So it's anticipated that you know, areas in the West will become a lot more arid, where we will get far more extreme events on our eastern coast. And some temperature modeling increases predict that in the West temperature increases will increase by 4% and then on the East up to 6%. So that means more droughts, you know, in the central and Western parts of South Africa. It means more extreme events like flooding, like we had with KZN um, on the Eastern side. These are not environmental issues or supply constraints that would in any way benefit our context right now. We are all already aware of, you know, some of the problems that um, abound in, in South Africa and the place that we all call home. So at the moment, some this might be a fact that some of you might be familiar with, but the, the building industry is responsible for about 40% of all global emissions. About 75% of that, so three quarters of that, is related to the in-use operations. So, i.e., you're in your office, you're in your house, you've got your lights on, and you, you know, you're working on your laptop. The other quarter of that relates to the carbon associated with the actual building blocks, so the bricks and the cement and the steel that you used. It's worthwhile understanding that our 
global building stock is expected to double, um, you know, in, in the coming few years up to, you know, 2050 and, and 2000. And a lot of that is expected to happen in Africa and in um, Asia. I think most of those mega cities are actually predicted for, for Africa. So, oops, sorry, I see this is transitioning. So just to, to recap, in terms of the built environment's contribution to global emissions, we've got in-use contributions of 39% and then embodied carbon or upfront embodied carbon, which speaks to that 11%, i.e. the bricks and mortar of the actual building. If we look at that 11% and we break it down and we use a typical office, where is that upfront embodied carbon coming from? This is an example, and there are a lot of similar studies. This is just one that we've extracted. You can see that the hotspots are the structure and the envelope, which count for more than half, you know, of well, I mean, two thirds of the of the embodied carbon. So really, getting the structure and the facade right means that we can solve a significant proportion of the embodied carbon problem. So, sorry, I, these transitions did not <laughs> listen to my instruction uh, when I tried to take them off. Um, the, this graph demonstrates that embodied carbon obviously is supported throughout, you know, and exists and occurs throughout a building's life cycle, but the vast majority of it happens, at, you know, when you build the building, right? So that's the biggest point. So at practical completion, that is when your proportion of embodied carbon across the building's life cycle is going to be the highest. In other words, designers and contractors are the most important points of change because they are the ones who are going to influence that pink bar on the left that says practical completion. The next important thing to remember, however, is that as grids decarbonize, the relative proportion of embodied carbon is going to increase. So you can see embodied carbon here is in the yellow. And so let, let's say we think about Iceland. You get a lot of their energy from geothermal. No, I know not the case in South Africa, but their in-use proportion for buildings will have almost no carbon associated with it. So therefore, if you compare that to the embodied proportion of that building, the embodied proportion exists, you know, represents basically all of that building's carbon. And so those tar targets would have to be brought down even more. Our grid is decarbonizing, maybe not at the speed of some European grids, but it is decarbonizing. And because of supply constraints and, you know, just kind of reading articles from South Africa, I think the private sector is going to drive that transition uh, even faster into the future. So just to recap, you have carbon over the whole life cycle of a building. The carbon associated with actually making the bricks, actually making the reinforced concrete is called embodied carbon. The carbon associated with you know, the building actually being operational and people being inside it and using it is operational carbon. And together they form whole life carbon. In terms of the targets that have been set for these different stages in a building's life cycle, we are globally, and all many green building councils have signed up to this, many um, organizations within the built environment, we are aiming that all of our buildings are net, need to be net zero operationally by 2030, and all buildings need to be transformed, transformed to net zero by 2050. And then in terms of operational, sorry, embodied carbon, we want a 40% 40, 40 reduction, particularly in upfront embodied carbon um, by 2030. And then, um, you know, an actual target has not been set for, 20, for 2050 because we're not sure about how far we can push that. So I think as designers, I just wanted to, to you know, maybe reiterate that, you know, net zero is very much a focus at the moment right now we engage with it you know as as the most common query and question that we receive this is also where we um, see most developers focusing their attention to 
We've seen massive change on the international building scale. So, for example, in the UK and London, it is almost becoming standard for designers, the structural engineers and the architects. You know, they have to do embodied carbon and up, upfront optioneering and uh, considerations as part of their uh, either their planning approval or, um, you know, to demonstrate that they have con considered different options. Some of you might be more familiar with um, things like leaving a positive impact or terms like regenerative design. And, and that's kind of where we want to be moving. You know, we acknowledge that the built environment does have impacts. How do we transform those into a way so that we actually leave a positive impact with the building that we um, that we build? And, and I will admit that this is very difficult. I don't think we have any examples of this in South Africa or, or even globally. So back to timber, using timber in the design and the construction of a building has got two significant impacts. You can see in the pink, it influences the upfront embodied carbon associated with the building. And then obviously because of its thermal insulation, but that you know wouldn't only be the timber, there would be a whole bunch of other elements to, you know, but it would contribute to the operational energy use. Um, and that might also factor in other ways in terms of how the building has you, you know, been considered. Uh, so, for example, maybe a timber building is designed with a certain facade element, and that allows for you know increased use of natural ventilation. I'm not saying it's only exclusive to timber. Um, then you know you would be using less aircon. Um, so, so you know, I'm, I'm just saying it's not a it obviously informs and um, interacts with other building design elements. OK, so. In terms of how this is incorporated into green building certification, um, I think I just wanted to touch on the fact that certification is there, like I said, to provide a standard metric for industry to have to assess how um, this building performs according to a benchmark uh, for the industry. The main thing always to remember with certification is it must have a background role. So it's about focusing on first design principles, what is sensible, what is contextually appropriate. It's a you know good design translates into sustainable design. If you are if you are incorporating good design principles, I have never been in a situation where that does not translate into you know sustainability. So I stand to be corrected, but that has generally been my experience in practice. Um, and so I haven't gone into you know the technical detail of the certification. I want to keep it principle based in terms of understanding how you can work on projects and how you can say to a client, if we are using timber, this is how it will support the rating that you're pursuing. Um, so if you're busy with a new building um, and it's maybe targeting a green star rating or you're doing an interior fit out um, and you're getting a green star fit out rating. The rating systems, the green star rating systems recognize the use of sustainable timber, but it needs to be FFC certified timber. So as Gerard has explained, uh, you know, you, timber is great. We also know that, unfortunately, you know, with with you know humans, there is trade of timber that is you know not responsibly managed and responsibly sourced. So it's very important to know that you are using responsibly sourced timber. And so FFC timber would contribute and would be recognised and rewarded. So normally it's about a proportion of the contract value. Um, so there also needs you know it can't just be a desk that you're fitting out, but obviously needs to, the timber needs to be a significant proportion of, of, of the building design. It can also contribute to dematerialization efforts where maybe there are structural savings in comparison to a standard building and you in effect need less because you're building with timber and you would compare that to, to a reference building. Where you can source your timber locally, and, and that is possible in South Africa, you can then, you know, be rewarded for local sourcing because we know that that obviously contributes to you know local supply chain um, support, but also uh, less transport-related emissions. 
And then lastly, if you used recycled or reused uh, timber, that would also, um, you know, contribute towards the uh, the the rating. In an interiors uh, rating, if you use FFC timber for any of your furniture, um, that would also, um, you know, contribute towards that. So I think it's worthwhile noting that, you know, uh, at the time, embodied carbon calculators were not uh, that prevalent or, or used that much. So, you know, timber was kind of uh, used in different elements of the of the rating tool. But so to be clear and just to confirm, the use of sustainable FFC timber is definitely rewarded and recognised within the rating systems. And obviously, it needs to make sense for your building and it needs to make sense for the context. You can also use timber and it will also be rewarded and recognized within the EDGE rating system for a new building, which is owned by the IFC, but the GBCSA is a certifier of EDGE. And I would encourage you to go online and play around with the EDGE tool. It's, you know, if you are doing a uh, kind of pre-assessment, it's free to use, you can register a project and you can test different options. But in effect, it doesn't measure embodied carbon, it, it measures embodied energy. A, a, a carbon conversion factor is on the cards and it will be included in the tool eminently. Um, and so in this materials category, there are many, you know, they'll either look at insulation or if look at roofing or look at walls or flooring. And wherever there's a timber option, there will be an, an energy, um, you know, association with, with uh, the timber. And so, you, I mean, I think obviously all of these tools in effect reward the fact that timber sequesters carbon. So there's obviously energy involved in manufacturing timber and transporting it. So it's not, it's not that it has zero effect, but it's also about measuring it over the life cycle of a, um, of a building. And one also needs to understand what happens at, you know, at the end uh, of that building's life cycle. But in terms of that upfront embodied carbon, timber, timber's carbon factor in comparison to steel and to cement and to concrete, um, and particularly you know, reinforced concrete, would typically be lower. So normally you would get these factors from the database that you're using uh, in an embodied carbon calculation. And you would obviously then times that by the quantity and the volume um, of the material that you're using, and that would enable you to look at different design options. So where you are replacing concrete or timber, you would then have an embodied carbon, a significant embodied carbon reduction. So just to put some exciting developments on your radar, and if there's anybody who would like to get involved, who would like to have a bit more information or try to test some stuff out, um, we're happy to engage. Going forward, all green star buildings will have to do an embodied carbon assessment. They don't necessarily have to reduce it. That will just be for the next two or three years. But it's just to get that high level, whether it's a back of the envelope kind of conversation going as part of the design process and keeping in mind that it's about thinking about the bigger picture. It's keeping a principle based, not getting stuck in you know, accounting for the sake of accounting. But, you know, the end point of saying, how can we decarbonize the trajectory of this building? And then we're also coming up with criteria just to look at upfront embodied carbon um, and actually just give a rating, you know, just for that, because there are investors and particularly within the investor space, increasingly um, there are requests and requirements for, for these kind of metrics. So these are the key impact areas that we will be using to define green buildings as we update our green star tool and this is a really exciting development we're going to be redefining green buildings for south africa um, you know we've done and by we i mean the collective we the gbcsa all the green building consultants the professionals who have worked on all of these projects and provided feedback um you know have, have kind of worked 
with the framework for the last 10 years, but it's now time to update that and to you know include things like a people category where we really only look at uh, the contractor and you know the procedures that they use uh, for responsible uh, construction management on site. It includes things like resilience. It includes things like embodied carbon. And so we are toying with some of the targets, um, and we obviously have a lack of data in South Africa, because we don't have many life cycle carbon assessments done on buildings. With you know, we just don't have a big enough data set in South Africa in order to inform a huge sample or any form of representative sample to come up with a benchmark. So we have to kind of rely on international precedent. And so that is why we're testing it with this requirement in the beginning for all buildings to conduct these assessments and we will get that feedback. And so we can refine the benchmarks going forward. If there's anybody here who's done many carbon upfront and carbon and upfront and body carbon assessments on your on your projects, um, we would love to hear from you. And then back to Howard's point, a, a big, big, big theme in the tool and where Timber will play a role. Um, so obviously Timber will play a role in the um, upfront and body carbon, but it will also very importantly play a role in how you demonstrate the use and the procurement of responsible products. Um, and so typically Timber was the only one that we really included in the frameworks, but going forward, we will extend that to other elements um, of a building, you know, looking at uh, mechanical services as well and other elements of the facade, particularly through either third party validation and, and eco labels, such as FFC Timber. So FFC Timber will um, be able to inform, you know, the new tool going forward as one. Well. Um, and this will be a significant update for the market. And so just, you know, to clarify that, yes, you can be net zero operationally, but you can also be net zero in terms of your upfront embodied carbon. So this is where as designers you will get involved, uh, you know, because your product that you select needs, you know, raw materials. It's got to be transported, manufactured. It's got to come to site. Um, and so, you know, these five elements inform that carbon factor of the material that you as the architect specify, whether that's steel, reinforced concrete, timber, aluminium, uh, you know, amount of glazing. Um, so we will be able just to isolate that and 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 assess that. And that will obviously also be aligned with the with the broader green star tool. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think just in conclusion, you know, timber is a sustainable option to build with and is particularly important for um, you know the embodied carbon conversation if used appropriately. Just some examples, this is quite a well-known example. The majority of the examples are obviously either European. Um, we engage quite a lot with the Australian context because there's a lot of similarity in climates and so there are some great examples in Sydney particularly around some upcoming plans um, and also like Toronto, Canada, um, some parts of the states that's typically the, the, you know where I see examples coming through of, of high-rise um, buildings and just to clarify um, you know the focus from the conversation today you know has been more on commercial uh, options and, and opening up that market. So this is, I think it's 18 floors. Um, it's mainly resi, but it's you know also got some mixed use, some retail on the bottom. Um, and this is based in Norway and used CLT timber panels. This is a local example from the University of Pretoria. Skolk probably knows a lot more about it than what I do. Um, but this is the Future Africa Innovation Campus where plywood was used um, and, and tested structurally within, um, you know, different elements of of this campus. Um, and I've, you know, I've seen the pictures. I've never visited myself. I would love to have a look um, and and come visit. Um, I'll give uh, Dani Hoffman a call at, at the University University of Pretoria. But just to show you a local example, um, you know, we also came across a multi-unit residential example. Um, where South African FFC uh, 
plywood was used. I don't know how successful these are, um, but, you know, just beyond, you know, just single dwelling units, but also to have, um, you know, multi-unit uh, resi options. And I can imagine that the construction um, time for this was obviously reduced. So in terms of green buildings that we have certified, and I have mentioned this before, there is a lot of innovation around materials in South Africa. We don't see them come through at scale within the data of certified buildings. Um, so it's definitely happening there, and, and, and I get approached by many manufacturers and, and product suppliers, particularly with wood-based uh, you know, alternative materials. So, you know, it might be a timber product or it might be a timber based product where there is, you know, less, uh, where there's cement replacement with, um, with you know, timber uh, trips and, 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 and off cuts. But this is an example of building. It's called the Ridge Studio Mass with the architects, Arup with the sustainability consultants. It's in the waterfront. It was a headquarters for Deloitte. It achieved the highest Green Star design rating, and it also achieved the highest Green Star as built rating, it's a six star Green Star. Um, but this is the first building we've seen in South Africa and that we're aware of at scale, and a commercial building, not not a single um, you know dwelling unit for a home that has used structural timber. So you can see it's got a zigzag, um, like a sawtooth facade. And the panels that you are looking at are structural timber. So it's not cladding. It's, um, you know, obviously has a structural component. The sawtooth requirement came in because of the site's orientation. And in effect, they needed to, you know, twist the angle of the building for solar heat. Um, so, so in effect, you know, protecting um, one orientation against the sun's heat gain, but then optimizing it where the glazing has been placed. So, you know, all of the timber that, that has been used here is, is local, um, and it was cross-laminated timber panels. Um, there is an outside weather membrane, which is, um, if I remember correctly, I think it's a coir uh, pine, um, that is going to act as a weather membrane, and that, you know, can be removed with time. But this is, yeah, this is definitely the biggest, the largest commercial scale example we've seen of um, a building lowering its embodied carbon, upfront embodied carbon, with the use of an alternative material, notably timber. Got some resources there. And then to end off, we uh, the Green Building Council was in Barcelona last year, along with the city of Cape Town and with the Western Cape government and with UCT, uh, African Centre for Cities, and the Economic um, Development Partnership Organisation uh, to talk about net zero and how do we get, you know, collaborating between cities um, on net zero trajectories. For all of the architects listening and, and watching, that's the iconic Mies van der Rohe Pavilion. Um, and we were there as part of a uh, installation and it was a mass timber installation because of a funding initiative in terms of funding a lot more timber within Spain. And um, yeah, so I mean, the thinking behind it at the time, you know, just to end off with looking back, we've been using traditional materials, but standing on the wooden platform, what is the future that we, you know, want to look out for? And, you know, what does that future look like? And obviously the exhibition was promoting, you know, that the future is timber. And so I think, you know, in closing, thank you um, to all of the architects, you know, how are you meeting these targets and how can you incorporate, you know, timber? I know there are other options as well to try and reach them. Thank you. Thank you, Georgina. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so good to see some beautiful buildings that are being made. Um, hopefully a little bit more, a few more in South Africa in the very near future. There are a few questions there's a little bit of activity on the chat um i see i see bram posted um some questions for 
Gerard, which I think Gerard has answered anyway in the in the chats. But uh, if there's anything you want to add, uh, Gerard, uh, to to Brahms' questions, and to I think Skulk also posed a question around how much of the South African plantations are FSC accredited. What does this mean for anyone who who wants to ensure that their timber buildings are built from sustainably sourced timber? Gerard, are you able to answer that? Uh, yes, uh, yes, Sam, I am. Um, so, so the the figure is, um, yeah, I mean, South, uh, South Africa has one of the highest percentages of plant certified plant certified plantations in the world. It's just over eighty percent, eighty percent that are that that is FSC certified. Um, and obviously, it's we're looking at about one point. To one, well, 1 1.3 million hectares that are that are certified. Um, but I think the important thing to understand is is um, this is the supply chain uh, integrity. In that, it's not just to say a case of like, oh yes, the timber comes from an FEC certified plantation, therefore I can claim that it's FEC certified. Okay, it has to go through a chain of custody process for that verification to occur. You know, so it's a case of ensuring that there's no mixed use of timber through the supply chain. So that's just essentially what will happen is that the sawmill, uh, yes, it might be it might be sourcing from its own FEC certified forest. So we can take, for example, any any one of the, the sawmilling groups have their own FEC certified plantations under the FEC st forest management standard. But then, as then, there's obviously full accountability of full, full. What's the word I'm looking for? Full verification from when the timber, when the when the when the fire, wood fiber leaves the forest to when it actually goes into the supply chain, and that's where the chain of custody certification occurs. And then, as that timber changes hands within the supply chain, it is then uh, it, is, it is then certified at the next production process. So each of those members within the chain are FEC certified. OK, so this is where we must be aware of just making blanket statements saying, oh, no, it's all FEC certified timber. Its source may come from those forests, but it does need to be verified at each stage in the supply chain. And that's where the, the, the players in the supply chain are audited on an annual basis, according to the chain of custody standard. Uh, and then they waste basically what they look at is they look at inputs, outputs in terms of um, percentages. Uh, in terms of separating FEC certified uh, stock from non-FEC certified stock. So a proper claim can be passed on to each member of the supply chain and then is done through an invoice with the FEC code on, on the actual invoice. Great, thank you. Um, Skulk, do you want to pose your question that you put in the chat directly to Georgina? The one around um, awarding green certificates? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, she actually answered it to some degree. Oh, did she? Okay. So, but um, I think the second part of the question is still relevant. Um, so my question related to whether you've had the privilege of um, certifying any timber-based structures in South Africa, and you just illustrated that you have. Um, my question is, did you experience any challenges um, during that process, specifically related to the timber certification, and how did, if you had any challenges, um, hopefully you didn't, but if you had, um, how did you overcome them? Thank you. Thank you, Skulk. Um, they, so from a certification perspective, no, we, we didn't have any challenges. I, I know that there were some challenges, you know, on the project, um, and it was more around, you know, supply chain issues and um, kind of, you know, contract issues and those kind of things. And um, it might be worthwhile sharing, you know, the details of the team, you know, with the series so that they could join as um, a guest panel and kind of talk everybody through, you know, their experiences and and the lessons learned. Um, I can definitely, I can definitely do that. I think part of the challenge however, was around, you know, saying how much is enough for the South African context. So in terms of, you know, our role as a certifier is to set that benchmark. Um, and so we could quantify, you know, the amount of uh, CO2 that was that was sequestered and that was saved, um, but also in terms of, you know, pitching that um, against, some, uh, against local data that, I mean, we overcame that challenge with, you know, uh, kind of international comparisons. 
um, and it wouldn't be endemic to this building. You know, it could be any building in South Africa at the moment. So I think I think data collection around um, embodied carbon, and more importantly, the bigger issue around getting data sets that are reflective of South Africa, because right now, you know, we don't have data for Af South Africa or Africa. It's ba it's mainly, you know, either Australian or European or American. Um, and, and then you sometimes have this, you know, big difference between, the, you know, particularly like the European numbers and, and maybe the Australian numbers. So it's, you know, getting that data set for, for our continent, um, I think is important, but that's not, that shouldn't stop anybody there are enough comparative reference points to um, to start the journey around measuring embodied carbon. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, I know uh, there's a comment um, from uh, Prof. Uh, Brunt Vessels on the chat, Georgina. You, I'll I'll just uh, point you to that. Um, but maybe you can answer it on the chat. But there is, I know there is some work actually being done at, on the Paper Manufacturers Association side to do some life cycle analysis with South African data sets. Um, whether or not it includes timber, I'll have to check. Um, there's a question here from Quibus Stratum. Um, and Quibus, I think I can answer that for you, is what consideration has been given with regard to the safety of timber structures, construction or assembly techniques also that are also of a major importance using timber? We have covered some of these topics in previous webinars, so I invite you to go and look at the YouTube link that I did send you. And we are in the next few months also focusing on different, um, different topics like joint techniques um, and things like that. Bram de Villiers will um, correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah, we we try we trying to. There's so much to cover on the topic of timber that we have to literally compartmentalize it all into into different topic sectors. Let me just check if there are any other burning questions. There was oh, a question. Uh, sorry. Yes. No. About, go for it. About uh, non-FEC certified timber from outside of South Africa. Um, so yes, sure there is, but don't forget, you know, we do have more than 4 million hectares of uh, certified tim natural forests certified in the Congo Basin. So, you know, it, it's obviously a, a different regimen than plantation timber where it's selective harvesting that is practiced, but it's under a forest management plan. Okay. So FEC certifies both natural and plantation forests. So you can source uh, exotic hardwoods that are FEC certified or any other kind of hardwoods as well. That, that, that is possible. Obviously, we want to promote uh, South African pine. Um, no, we, we, we do. <laughs> of course we do. Of, of, no, of no, course just, we do. Of course no, we do. But no. I mean, that it's, 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 a, it's a reality. In that no, it thing. is a reality. Yeah, yes. no, that, that obviously there's certain, you know, different horses or different courses in terms of timber, you know. Um, right. So uh, that, that 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 is possible. Um, Shepard and Corsi, you've asked for some contact details. We will do so. Um, uh, Georgina, perhaps you can uh, just pop your contact details into the um, chat box for for anyone who is wishing to reach out to your team. Um, there is a question here as well from Vishal Harishund. What steps uh, would a producer treated poles need to follow to ensure their products receive FEC? certification and are there any FEC certified treated pole producers? Um, yes, we do have a few uh, treated pole producers. In the past, the demand was more in terms of East Africa in terms of the big transmission projects in East Africa, where it was a government requirement in terms of tenders that the poles are FEC certified. Unfortunately, a lot of those contracts have now turned to concrete. OK, um, but yes, so as a pole producer, you can get you obviously the, first of all it, it's in terms of where you're sourcing your um your poles from in terms of which forest whether the forest is fec certified so that's your first step that you're sourcing it from an fec certified plantation um fortunately most of the big plantations are fec certified the second step would be that you as a pole treater would need to apply for chain of custody certification so you can sell that pole on with an fec claim on your invoice so then what would happen is you would contact a certification body who would then come and do an assessment. They would provide you with a quote in terms of an annual audit. Uh, you would then need to put together a procedure manual based on 
the FSC chain of custody standard, and you then are, are then audited against that uh, manual on an annual basis. And then, and then, yeah. So that's that's how the the the, the system the system operates. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, but have I, I think we've covered everything. Is there anything else you want to ask our panelists before we? Sorry. Professor Vessels did ask a question. So his yes. question was related to a study that they did a couple of years um, ago to evaluate the green building um, certification process. And um, I'm just going back to the question, but uh, the evaluation indicated that the even if a building got um, uh, basically full marks for timber use, the total impact on the, the rating is almost negligible. So his question also related to considering that the, the embodied carbon going forward will have a um, bigger influence on the total impact of the building. Is there a, a consideration to renew the certification process? And, and def and explicitly the writing of the timber component, or let's say the material used of that has an embodied carbon impact on the the building. That's mm -hmm. more or less the question. No, thanks. I'm I'm happy to speak to that. And yes, that is a query we we get quite often. We don't always get it. We don't only get it from the timber industry. Everybody asks us why. <laughs> Do you know? Does our issue not not count for more? Yes. Um, and 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 so um, I mean I think so there, there are two answers to that. The first part is with the existing scheme. Yes, I would say there are probably four to, to six points that you know would be would be achieved within the broader um, within the broader scheme. I do think, however, there's still scope within the innovation category. So your green building consultant would say, okay, you don't have you know this embodied calculator embedded within the tool, but I've done this one and they can demonstrate their savings. So I think that there's still an avenue to have it rewarded. It is worthwhile noting, and we have done embodied carbon, we've done whole life um, assessments on uh, buildings in, in South Africa, and our operational carbon is still comparatively over the life cycle of a building because of our grid it, it, it's it's huge in comparison. It's like 85% even more uh, compared to the embodied carbon. That's not an, you know, that's not a reason to say we shouldn't be focusing on embodied carbon. But obviously, you know, we're gonna we're gonna try and incentivize the market to get the first problem sorted. You know, um, before it moves, you know, to the second. So that is, you know, kind of where we've come from. So I would say that there is still scope to. Um, reward, um, but acknowledging maybe that it's not, you know, it could be more, but that's why in the new tool, I would say there's a massive focus on embodied carbon and the use of timber would be, um, you know, significantly rewarded and, you know, moving forward, that change and everything we've just spoken about now, you know, is built and embedded within it. So thank you. That is, you know, a valid comment. And yes, we we have addressed it. Thank you. That Thank you so much. Sense. Yeah, I think that's all good. Thank you so much, Skulk, um, for being um, a co-anchor <laughs> to uh, Georgina and to Gerard. Thank you very much for your presentations. I'm now going to just invite Tafatua Nyazunda from the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, otherwise known as the DTIC. Um, she is a very, very staunch supporter of our sector and does a lot of hard work in helping us promote timber. Um, wood pulp and paper in, across the sector and so I'll invite her to just deliver the closing remarks. Over to you Tafatua. Um, thank you very much um, Samantha. Uh, I think some of you are, are even wondering what is DTIC doing here so I'll just uh, highlight the work where I am in the DTIC. I am in the sector desk so what we do is we promote industrial growth in sectors that the government has prioritized and forestry is one sector that the government is prioritized 
as such, we do have a forestry master plan that the DTIC leads in one of the pillars, which is processing. And we also have a furniture master plan that the DTIC is leading. And um, I liked the presentations because they speak to the work that the DTIC is doing in trying to grow the sector that is number one and promoting industrialization. And hence, this actually forms the core of the work that we do. We want to see more buildings out there in timber, built in timber. And uh, I was actually trying to type a question to Georgina to say that, is it possible that these uh, the scale on when you are doing this rating or the certification that we can also begin to see that the embodied carbon is weighing uh, some more so that we use that as a lever to promote um, people to build more. Thank you very much. So let me do what I've been requested to do was just to deliver a vote of thanks um, to firstly um, our Presenters, uh, uh, Gerard uh, from the Forest Steward, uh, from the Forest Stewardship Council. I think I have learned, and uh, most of us who are here on the call have also learned that we do not just certify the forest, but we are certifying uh, the value chain, and I think that is key. I would also like to thank uh, Georgina Smith. Uh, you've really uh, done a great work, especially on the carbon, um, net zero carbon. We actually have some work that we need to do, some research that we have assigned. Uh, UP is doing that work, and I'm sure you're going to be very instrumental in trying to assist and say, how can we then also influence policy development in terms of uh, the, the enforcing the carbon. So right now, uh, I think very soon we will be seeing that the building regulations are being uh, reviewed. So we would want uh, this audience to make input when it comes to that stage where uh, the bill will be uh, published for, for, for input. Um, to our participants, um, uh, thank you for staying this long and uh, also to listening to the full conversation without the participants, then uh, we would not speak to ourselves. Our sponsors, uh, this webinar was sponsored by the FSC. Thank you very much for that. Um, you spoke and then you sponsored as well. And uh, our partners, uh, Somilling SA is the anchor of this uh, work that we are doing. They funded quite a lot of the webinars. Uh, the University of Stellenbosch very, played a very key role the forestry um, department there with Dr. Oh, Professor Brad Vessel. The University of Pretoria is also uh, supporting this work uh, partly, and also they've, they're doing some work for the DTIC, but they're also doing a whole lot of work uh, into the sector. So um, I will not be able to mention all, but Earthworld has been actually utilizing their time without anyone um, rewarding them. So we very um, uh, are grateful for the work that is doing. All we need to see is the diversity in the sector. All we need to see is more product. And I think we can testify that when we started talking about timber and construction, we were not making our own cross-laminated timber. Now we do. Localization has happened and it's one of the goals that our DTIC is uh, promoting. We need to create more jobs out there and we need to promote localization. So thank you for sharing those uh, case that to, to me it becomes a case study and uh, the work uh, that you are doing. So I think as Dr. Skalk has talked about and has pasted the design competition, uh, we also as DTIC are partnering in that competition and we would like you to please, if you are an architect, uh, come in and, and enter an architect uh, short student, uh, please, I think in the next phases, we will then be having uh, two categories where we have a students and as well as the 
uh, um, professionals participating in the competition, or you can come in as a as a sponsor to the competition. That would be good. We also doing that survey uh, that Dr. Skalk has talked about. Can you please also participate in the in the survey? Uh, I think the efforts that are being made to equip the users is very key, and we do appreciate that. Um, I understand. I'm not so sure if Emma has joined, but if there's anyone from the um, Nelson Mandela University, may you please please uh, just also put in the link for the Indaba that is going to be the building Indaba that is going to be done. Can you also put that? It's going to be done in partnership with um, uh, the human settlement. So there is going to be Indaba on the human settlement and Timba is also participating there. So I, I'm not so sure if Emma is there, but now we do have your contacts. We can also send you the invite once it's ready. So there is a lot uh, that is happening in the Timba environment. I think this week is just a uh, choker blocker. We do also have a um, workshop on Thursday on the 8th. We will circulate the invitation if you had not RSVP'd so that you get to understand much of the work that we are doing. So Milling SA, I think they've already sent out also their uh, AGM. So there's a lot that is happening. We also do have now um, the two a social kind of like a group on Facebook as well as on the LinkedIn, join and participate in the conversation. Once again, thank you. Thank you, Tafato. Much appreciated. Um, really, uh, you've captured all of the things that um, we needed to cover in the voting set, vote of thanks. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Georgina. You've popped your email address in the chat, and so has Gerard. And also just a mention about the woodapp.com. Um, yes, these, these conversations keep going. I see there is a hand raised by Isaac. Um, he's taken it down. Um, but Isaac, if you want, you can reach out to me directly. And if you have a question, you can send it to me on email and I will push it to the relevant party. Um, without much more to say, I want to just thank Georgina again and thanks, Gerard, and thank you for your sponsorship. Um, it is uh, most appreciated. Thank you and stay warm and have a great week. Mm -hmm.